So this is the analyst dashboard. Every day when I begin my work, this is the view that I see. So we see all of the programs that have already executed on the system listed here. So we see the program name, which is white to indicate that we have not seen it before. Green is something we have seen before. And yellow is something that we have to watch more closely. So from this 205 timesheet file, we see all of the respective activities listed underneath. So what programs it opened. One of them is CMD, which is a native part of the operating system, but it can be used to do bad things. We have the cryptographic hash. This is white to indicate that, again, we have not seen this before. We have network communications, so we've allowed private network communications in the past. However, the relationship between 205 timesheet and private network communications has not been seen. So we're going to review that. And then we have the command lines that are running from the program. So let's go over another example. So again, all of this stuff is activities that have already executed on the system. So we're iteratively going through all of this activity on a regular basis, looking for anything that has bypassed those traditional security measures. And because they're able to bypass them, they tend to be a bit more advanced when they show up in this view. So let me show you how I actually get to the, the actual attacks. So I see AM Delta patch here, which is green to indicate that we've allowed it in the past, at least the program name. We have a white hash because we haven't seen this hash before. And this is part of our zero trust model. So even if a program name is known, we're still analyzing the new activity that's generated by it. So under this hash, we have our threat intel. So it's a, it's here through an integration with virus total. So we have zero companies which have listed this hash as malicious. And then we also have the Microsoft icon over here to indicate that Microsoft has signed this product as their own. So it's a known program that's coming in with a new hash. It's from Microsoft. It looks like the command line is running from some kind of software distribution directory. And as the name says, it's a patch. So this is likely an update to a known program. And because it's from Microsoft, I have high confidence that it, you know, it's not compromised, it's safe. I'm going to click over here and put this on our allow list. And the next two programs, they have green hashes. So we, I've already allowed this program and all of its functions before. So I'm going to go and allow those two through. So they look to be patches as well. And all that's left are these two programs. One is the timesheet file, one is a ransom file. It's a bit of a suspicious name. And also a red flag to me as an analyst is the, the fact that this is a timesheet. However, it's in an executable format. So that's a, that's a red flag. Also, it's opening CMD, which is yellow because it's something we have to watch more closely, even though it's a native part of the operating system. And then we have no threat intel on the hash. So it just says NA. And the same pattern of activity is occurring for this ransom file. So I'm going to investigate this in a bit more depth using our patent pending stack view. So this is just a, a quick and easy way for me to re review a large number of logs in a quick amount of time. So the important information from those logs have been summarized or truncated into this one view that allows me to efficiently review large amounts of information. So in the client, we have internal demo. The device, we have workstation one and workstation two. And then we have the sequence of events that are that's occurring. So near the bottom, we have a process creation event happening on workstation one with the user Hank. 
we have the child and parent processes. So we have Explorer as the parent process, which means that Hank has manually clicked something. So Hank has manually clicked the ransom file from this directory, from his desktop. So let's go up in the sequence of events. Nothing interesting there, it's just ransom to ransom. We have a network communication. It's occurring from the ransom file. So this is the internal IP address of Hank's machine. And we have another internal IP address, which is interesting. Maybe we will find out what that is. All right, so we have workstation one again. The user is Hank. The parent process is ransom 205. And the ransom file is opening CMD, which, as I said, was something we have to watch more closely. And it's using CMD to copy itself to a shared drive called uh, Fait de Temps, or Timesheet in French. And then it's changing its name to 205 Timesheet. So this was the upload to the internal IP that we were seeing. So the ransom file is uploading itself to a shared drive. And at this stage, uh, this clearly looks like an attack to me because so the first device was compromised and now this uh, malware file is attempting lateral movement by changing its name and uploading itself to uh, a drive that a bunch of people are trying to access to upload their work hours. But they've changed the name to 205 Timesheet in order to trick these users into clicking this instead of the actual timesheet. So let's see if anyone actually fell for it. All right, so we have computer name workstation two. The user is now Julie. And the parent process is Explorer, so Julie manually clicked the 205 timesheet file from the shared drive, unfortunately. So now there have been two devices that were compromised. And what I'm going to do is I'll create a ticket to alert you. So in the ticket, what I'll tell you is what's happening. What is the impact on your company or the company that you're working with? Uh, what are the next steps? on your side, so for your internal IT, what would be the steps that you have to take? So I might recommend, for example, removing the malware file from the, the timesheet drive. Then I would request authorization to begin my response. So what does that mean? I can isolate the two devices from the network to prevent further spread. I can intercept communications with a command and control center. I can search for persistence hooks, really anything that I can do to mitigate the damage on the company. So it, it really, it's a creative process that changes with the situation. And at this point, I'm wondering if you have any questions or if it's clear how we differ in terms of our coverage in respect to other security products like an antivirus or a traditional alerting type of EDR. We have a question here from a participant. It says, uh, you mentioned that anytime you have a suspicious file, you run it through VirusTotal. Recently, we've been seeing theft of signed device drivers. If a signed device driver gets used for a piece of malware, that's not going to be in VirusTotal and that software will appear to be signed by a valid provider. Do you have anything to prevent these kinds of novel attacks that we're starting to see? Yes, absolutely. So when I was talking about post-exploitation, uh, what we're hearing, seeing here is still at the installation phase. So post-exploitation is really looking at things such as living off the land attacks occurring through PowerShell or CMD cert util that would occur as a result of these signed safe looking hashes. So let me show you an actual example. I'm going to show you some actual PowerShell attacks that I've caught. All right, so here we have PowerShell. Again, it's yellow to indicate that it's something we have to watch more closely. So let's say we have 
a Word document that comes in through a spear phishing email. That Word document is embedded with PowerShell. So the Word document won't be blocked by the antivirus because just like the other products that you're describing, it has a known safe hash and virus total. And PowerShell is allowed to run on the system. So we would see the PowerShell running from that malware embedded Word document. So this is exactly what we're seeing here. So these are a bunch of living off the land attacks that have occurred. So they use encoded PowerShell. So it's PowerShell running from this directory. They're bypassing the execution policy. And then they're specifying that whatever comes after is an encoded string. So let's go and see what that is. This is something that I ran on my device to teach some of my students uh, how to perform a living off the land attack so then they know how to catch them more easily. So we have an encoded PowerShell command here. Let's say this was a, a safe file that had a safe hash in virus total. So we might miss that at the, at the first level if we're just seeing the installation then we would later catch it at the post exploitation phase. So what we can do is uh, input it here, which I already did, and we can see what's actually behind the behind the curtain. So this is obfuscated PowerShell. It's a way to bypass uh, the antivirus or traditional alerting systems because um, they might pick up on, you know, when you reassemble this, it just says super malware. So if it were to say super malware or have a known indicator of compromise in the string, that would trigger a flag on a signature list or it might trigger um, an alerting type of software to say, hey, this is definitely bad. But even this invoke expression will start to trigger some traditional types of EDRs that rely on alerts for suspicious strings. So if they see uh, if their system through AI or some kind of other automatic process will pick up on encoded strings and decode them to check, check if they're safe. An antivirus would not catch this, but a traditional EDR might with the invoke expression. But now we have even more suspicious and clever evil ways of bypassing that. So let me show you another one that I've written. So we have the super malware file, which I've added to a few variables. Then I reassemble those variables to basically say echo super malware. And then we have this pipe into this strange string. Let's see what this does. So I will share one more screen. All right, so I'm in PowerShell now. So something like this would not be able to be picked up by either a traditional EDR or an antivirus because we don't have the invoke expression written here. We just have this strange command. So PS home. What does this do? So PS home is just the location of the default PowerShell. Uh, yeah, it's the default location of PowerShell. If we have PS Home calling an index, we get I, E, and then if we just add the X at the end, we get IEX. So something like that would not be picked up unless you're seeing it from a threat hunting perspective, so actually looking at all of the command lines. So when you actually run it, it opens this malware file on the device and it bypasses the uh, both of your first lines of defense, so the antivirus and an alerting type of software. So the best chance of catching this is through threat hunting, which is what we do. So looking at all of that living off the land type of attack coming from PowerShell, coming from CMD or search util, anything that's native to the system that can be abused to download a malicious file or uh, obfuscate a command line will be used and we'll be able to catch it because for us, seeing something like 
an encoded PowerShell or a line like this, it sticks out like a sore thumb. So that's why some of our bigger clients will have us as the last line of defense after their uh, perimeter defenses are breached. They, we are sure to be able to catch these types of things. And I mean, I can talk at length, but let me give you one statistic. Uh, in the two years that I've worked here, I've been able to intercept numerous ransomware attacks and not a single one has gone through to the point where a client has actually had to pay up a ransomware demand because we catch it at the stage right at the beginning when they're um, performing their downloads of the uh, of the of the stager not even the ransomware locker just to give you a bit more of an idea of where threat hunting came from it actually has its origins in the military because they recognized that the existing solutions were not covering all of their bases so like i said you can have the antivirus at the perimeter you can have an alerting type of EDR, which will look for suspicious strings like PowerShell, invoke expression, download string. Any of these types of things will create an alert for alerting algorithms. So in order to bypass those, you take a roundabout way like this. You pull the IEX from the index and you bypass those things. So unless you are actively looking through all of that activity on a regular basis, you're not going to be able to catch something like that.